Welcome to The Buzz. I'm Christopher Conover. Last week, the Federal Centers for Disease Control declared most of Arizona has a low level of transmission for COVID-19. That means another step towards a return to what people refer to as normal. This week, we look at what that means for business. You can't help but notice as you run your weekly errands or go out with friends and family, things have changed for local businesses. Rob Elias, the president of the Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, says the past two years have been a learning experience, but of course also difficult. I think the main theme is just the uncertainty of it all, of things changing um, sometimes at, at a, on a daily pace of what the new guidelines were going to be, whether masking is good or masking isn't good, or what the what the time frame is to stay home if you have symptoms. I mean, there's just so much. Um, just in, in regular life, let alone if you're a business owner and trying to figure out what is staff, what our staffing levels are going to be. Can I allow people in my places of business? How many can I allow? Can we, do we have capacity for outdoor seating? It was just so much uncertainty within, within the, the world, within any industry um, for that matter. So just a lot of adjustments that needed to be made. Um, and our members, you know, God love them. They, they endured um, and, and are, are coming out of this thing, hopefully better than, than when we began. Did you all have specific programs targeted at helping your members as this went along? One of the biggest things that we focused on was accessibility to different things. And, and that hasn't really changed much, um, even two years after the fact, is people are looking for access to grants or finances or loans or education or marketing um, or accessibility to other businesses that, that they want to do business with. So we've had to shift a little bit of our model um, into just being more of that connector piece. Um, and it's worked out very well for our members and, and something that we don't plan on stopping anytime soon. If somebody comes to the chamber, comes to you and says, Rob, I'm interested in starting a business, but we're still sort of in the pandemic. Should I start a business? What do you tell them, especially with the uh, that uncertainty of what's next with the pandemic? We are low numbers right now, but who knows what will happen a month from now? Yeah, I think the biggest advice that, that we give is to, one, be prepared for lots of change. Be prepared for, um, and of course, it depends on what industry that they're wanting to, to explore or move into. Maybe they are more business to business and not business to consumer, um, it makes a huge difference. So be prepared. And the second piece is be patient. Um, and it's really hard for entrepreneurs to do that uh, because they, they have an idea, they have a vision, they have a purpose, and they want to roll with that. But so much changes so quickly these days. Many of us are not patient by our, our, our mere nature. How do you get people to be patient when they come to you and say, how long do I have to be patient? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. So I guess patience is a subjective term, isn't it? We try to give the best advice we can, given the circumstances that we're in. And, and the, the thing that we always go back to is, if this is your vision, if this is your purpose, if this is your calling, uh, and, and this is what your dream of, of opening this type of business it's worth it to do it right the first time. Now we we can we can push, we can we can test uh, and experiment to to some degrees, but when things push back, sometimes we have to say, okay, we we stepped we overstepped a bit. Let's take a step back, regather, and then move forward. When it comes to business and the economy, which business is a big part of, you know, we've got inflation going on right now. But if you're in real estate, it's a good time to be in real estate, especially if you're selling and not buying. So there, there's a lot going on as we move through the pandemic. What are you hearing from your members overall? How's business? Business has been on the uptick and people are very, very optimistic about where they see their business going. Um, 
the the one caveat that I mean, there are so many. We we can look back at this thing and say COVID has been the worst two years of 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 our life of my lifetime, or we can look back at it and say, what lessons did COVID teach us? How did COVID and all of its disastrous um, elements, including death for so many people, what did we learn from it? How did it make us better? And, and the people that can look at things from that standpoint are far better prepared to handle other challenges, not necessarily surrounding pandemics, but other issues that come with being a business owner. The, the, one, it, the one caveat, the one challenge that still remains, I say one, there, there's, there are a couple, but is the issue of staffing right now. Um, and and the and the workforce. So, regardless of what business you're in, whether you're in the re- in the restaurant business or you're in manufacturing um, or hospitality, there still is a workforce shortage, um, and there are help wanted signs everywhere. Um, now we can have a whole hour long discussion about about that, um, and maybe we'll get there somewhere down the line. But yeah, that's one challenge that we're facing now. That was Rob Elias, the president of the Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Many people felt the loss of contact with others acutely during the last two years of the pandemic. The falling infection numbers mean that some people are feeling safer about venturing out. Last weekend, we talked with some people about just that feeling following an evening performance held at 191 Tool, for the second day of the Tucson Hip Hop Festival at the UA Poetry Center. It was attended by about 100 people. Local rapper and musician Big Mama Trauma said it felt good to be back in front of a crowd. Felt like home because for so long we've been forced to be inside and it put a damper on us as music makers and artists and performers because Now we have to learn how to do it from home and solely on social media when what we like to do is is to reciprocate that energy and give and connect, you know. Uh, So being back outside with the COVID restrictions lifted, you know, it's like most of us are vaccinated and those of us who aren't, it's fine. It's your choice. We're all trying to be safe, adapt to the quote unquote new normal. But man, it was overwhelming nostalgia that came from going to an event yesterday and it's it just finally feels like we're getting there we're getting closer to figuring out what it's gonna be like from here on out my name is Jorge Tomagaña I go by b-boy house how was it being out at this festival you know now that COVID restrictions have kind of lifted the first major festival we've had since 2020 how has that felt I mean it's great no matter what just to be around other people that are nerds like you in, in this <laughs> stuff and that's all we are right um but, you know, you can still tell that there's still hesitation for people to, to come out and fully engage. You know, this is hip hop, so, you know, the old cliches can't stop, won't stop. Like, this is what we do. We're, we're resilient and we're going to keep on going. So it might manifest in a different kind of way, but it's always going to be here. Those were performers and attendees of the Tucson Hip Hop Festival last weekend. This week, we're looking at how local businesses weathered the first two years of the pandemic. We ended the last segment talking with people at the Tucson Hip Hop Festival. Maybe that isn't your cup of tea. How about a movie? Jeff Yance is the program director at the Loft Cinema in Tucson. He says things are rapidly moving towards normal. We're not quite there yet. Uh, We're actually in the process of discussing dropping our various pandemic protocols. Currently, I... Currently today, we have a mask mandate and a vaccination check and uh, reduced seating capacity for social distancing. But given the state of Pima County, that's kind of what we were waiting for, for those numbers to drop. And now that we're in a safe, safer zone, we're looking to do away with some or all of those. Uh, And what we've done throughout the pandemic is we've made our audience part of the process of the decision-making process, and if not the decision-making process, then at least sort of getting their uh, input on it to kind of keep them informed. And so we recently put out a survey asking how people would feel if we dropped our mandates, and uh, the majority said that they would be comfortable with that. 
when it comes to your audience, obviously people coming in, sitting in the seats, watching the movies, that's what you guys do um, with the reduced capacity and the hesitancy of people to go out for so long. How did you guys do? How did The Loft do through this two years? Well, I think like a lot of businesses, it's been a very uh, roller coaster experience. Uh, when we closed in 2020, that basically cut off all of our you know, incoming revenue because we weren't showing movies and that's what a movie theater does. So there was a lot of panicking. What do we do? Uh, we pivoted. I've decided to not use that term pivot anymore, but I just, <laughs> I used it a lot in 2020, but we moved towards virtual as a lot of theaters did as a stop gap before we could reopen. Uh, we also opened, we built and opened an outdoor screen on our properties called open air cinema, which proved to be very popular, which we've kept because people love seeing movies outdoors. Uh, so we had, we had some kind of creative solutions that a lot of particularly art house theaters were using throughout the country uh, to survive until we could reopen fully. So now that the numbers, at least for the moment, we, we won't speculate out into the future, but at least at the moment are dropping and things seem to be returning to something akin to normal. You mentioned the outdoor screens. How much of the, the stuff that you all put in is possibly going to stay in place just because people love it? Well, uh, definitely the, the open air cinema will stay. Uh, we're actually looking ahead a bit to when things become even more normal than they are now, upgrading that space to make it even more. It was sort of a makeshift space, to be honest, uh, in our parking lot. So we're looking to make that more of a permanent structure with uh, better seating and lighting and a better screen experience, because that was something that people said, we love this. We never really thought about doing it before. Uh, so the pandemic did engender some uh, kind of creative solutions that will stick with us for a while. Uh, we stopped doing virtual. It seemed like uh, most of our patrons moved away from that. Once we reopened for in-person screenings, the interest level just jumped off the cliff for the virtual for us. Uh, for the industry in general, of course, streaming and virtual and video on demand uh, is a big thing, which is something we're facing also an issue. When people started coming back, I know people were excited to get out of the house, uh, <laughs> especially initially. What was the reaction you got from most people? And what are you hearing with the COVID uh, protocols that are still in place? Granted, you're getting ready to make some changes. The general consensus was gratitude that we were being so careful and we waited a very long time to reopen for in-person screenings longer than any other theater in Tucson. We were closed for 14 months uh, for indoor screenings. We were doing our outdoor screenings much sooner than that. But our audience, again, keeping our audience in the loop of what we're doing and making them part of the process of how we're moving forward. They all really appreciated that we waited so long. They appreciated that we put all of these procedures in place uh, because they said that made them feel safe going back and they did not feel safe going back to other theaters that did not have those procedures in place. So that was really a hook for us. The safety was a hook to get people back. Uh, and in particularly in front art house, you have a lot of older patrons. Some, you know, uh, that age bracket that could be immunocompromised. They were very worried. Uh, so I think uh, th that was very helpful, sort of reaching out to our core audience and getting them back in. Uh, that's still not back up to full speed with the older audience, for sure. They've been the most reluctant to come back, just in general, in the industry. Young people are just in it to win it. They're coming back. They started coming back immediately. I would imagine if I had this same discussion with one of the big multiplexes that's showing Batman or, or whatever the hot movie at a multiplex is these days, they might have had a little different experience because they had that big corporate backing. You guys don't have the big corporate backing. So I would imagine your business experience, it was a little more touch and go. Yes. And what we have discovered and what I always knew, but this pandemic has really made this clear, is that 
the wheelhouse for an art house like the Loft Cinema is in specialty programming, special events, uh, community-based events. We don't rely on tentpole movies like The Batman and Spider-Man No Way Home. So our biggest screenings and our biggest films overall since we've reopened have been these kind of special events doing uh, a Wes Anderson series, which was very popular, tied into the French Dispatch, which did re really well for us. So finding those kind of art house films that people were willing to come back to and then piggybacking by doing special events around it uh, is really our saving grace because we know how to do that at the loft. So we're fairly nimble in that sense. If we were relying on first run films, we would not be surviving right now. That was Jeff Yance with the Loft Cinema in Tucson. When the pandemic began, gyms and places like that were forced to close by local and state governments. Even after they opened, health officials at times warned that gyms and other places were dangerous because they were indoors and people tend to be breathing harder. So how did places that help with staying in shape fare during the pandemic? Darren Rhodes, the director of Yoga Oasis, says it was really difficult. We barely made do uh, when the when COVID hit or, or started started to hit. I was told, "Oh, it's just the it's just the bad flu. Don't worry about it." And so people would come in. I'd say, "Oh yeah, yeah. There's no way we're going to close down." Well, the day I said that to uh, someone coming in, they said, "Oh, I'm so appreciative that you haven't shut down." I go, "No, no, we're not gonna." And the next day, we did. We have, we've been open since 1999, and the central location, there's never been a day that we didn't have classes, because on holidays, we always do donation classes. So we went from never being, ne never not having a class to pulling the plug and thinking, that's it. We, we, I just, I couldn't fathom how we were going to make it. Uh, with all our expenses intact, no finances coming in. So how did you make it? Did you do what a lot of people did and go online, or did you go out in the parking lot, or how did you make it? Well, we did all of it. So uh, we we made it in a couple ways. One, the community of practitioners rallied. Uh, without even asking, we got uh, checks coming in. And they didn't ask for anything in return. Someone said, I, I want to buy an annual. I'm like, well, we don't have classes. They said, we don't care. I called our landlords and said, uh, we're just going to have to end our lease if that's possible. And uh, instead of them saying, you can't or OK, they said, we'll take a free month. Uh, all except one studio, which shall remain nameless. Um, uh, and they just gave us, they said, we want you there and we'll do what it takes. Uh, two of the studios. And then we scrambled to get online. Uh, we went with one uh, venue that just looks terrible, cost us a lot of money. And a friend of mine, from Atlanta who runs a studio said, oh, you got to get on Nama Stream. Nama Stream was overwhelmed. We couldn't get on. But they expanded their whole thing. So it was a boon for them. And then they got us on. Uh, and again, the community rallied. They said they just signed up. We got lots of signups. Then we got creative. We opened in the parking lot of Yoga Oasis Central. Uh, which anytime someone throws a mat down and rolls it back up, it's just covered in black. So, <laughs> and then we, we put in um, some bamboo fencing to make it look somewhat nice. Uh, but luckily we had already been on the playground rooftop downtown and that's owned by our landlord uh, who we're straight across from. And they just generously said, uh, take all the cash, no cut, so we could put that toward rent. And Westward Look, a hotel, we already had classes there. And so we said, can we add more classes? And we added lots more. 
So going forward, as you know, we continue to live with COVID in whatever form it's going to be in, are some of these things going to be practices you just keep going because they proved to be popular or, you know, helped you reach out to audience that, that maybe it wouldn't have hit otherwise. Oh yeah. The, the long view now that we've stayed open is that I think we can recoup all the losses over the long term in a couple ways we already have. For example, we were doing a 300 hour teacher training and we pulled the plug. We found out about Zoom and the next weekend we were on Zoom. And at that point, it was a whole a new world that people had to get used to. Very disappointing, of course, to uh, some of the people in the teacher training. And yet they were grateful that the teacher training continued. There's actually one big benefit to having a teacher training on Zoom. When, when groups go to do drills inside, it's like being in a really cacophonous, noisy restaurant. Well, on Zoom, they go into their private room. It's very quiet. So there were, there were uh, upsides to that. And then um, we're lucky enough to have uh, connections to studios like uh, throughout the country, in the Netherlands, uh, where we did an 100% online teacher training. When it comes to yoga, of course, there's stretching and strengthening, but there's also more to it than that. Obviously, there's a, a mental part to it. Is it the same on Zoom, or do people need that community, even if it's a quiet community, you know, when they're doing their practice? Uh, there are uh, people who Zoom doesn't work clearly. And that's what's so uh, excellent about having these other options. So they're the ones that go to the studio, they go to the rooftop. And then there's others to, it was quite surprising to me that during COVID, how scary it was to go out. There's something very uh, calming to be in their own safe space. Uh, and yet, uh, having the motivation to push sign up. So I think one of the challenges, uh, people have is to have a home practice is unlikely with so busy to actually take time. And then, oh, I don't know how to talk myself through a practice. Uh, so they were able to, um, push and of course you can do it later that's a benefit of the recordings but even that it can be hard to motivate to find the time to sign in so for those that uh, it works for the zoom is the motivation to practice they're in a safe space and it's me too because i can see their dog running around their pet the background and i feel uh more connected to them in that sense, because I, it's almost like I'm in the living room teaching. Uh, and I can see them individually, whereas in a room that's more people can blend in and it's harder to, while they're practicing, make a connection. You're still busy or have become busy again after the initial dip. Definitely. One of the challenges we just had to do our, we had um, classes called Yoga Hour. Well, we still do. Uh, and those were $5. To, to go from, uh, to cut the classes into like a fourth of how many people could come, we had to go up to $10. So when you asked how did, what's one of the things we had to do to make it, uh, all classes became $10. Previously, a lot of them were $10. And we also go out of our way to be... Um, uh, to offer affordable classes. And that's why there was the $5. Though, uh, what I do still feel good about is um, the going rate here in Tucson is that or more. Uh, though there are, there are studios like 4th Ave Yoga, they're still offering, they just reopened actually. 
and um, they have five dollar classes. By the way, that's one of the neat things about the yoga community is we're in confluence, not competition. Or at least that's how I see it. I was going to ask you about that. You know, how much time did you spend talking to other studio owners? Did you guys work together to figure this out as we were all trying to figure it out? Uh, we didn't so much work together uh, until, for example, Tony contacted me and said, hey, I need teachers. Uh, and that's one of the, you know, we have teacher trainings. So um, that's great. I'm like, okay, here's some. He's actually so respectful. He's like, I don't want anyone who's currently teaching, but people who did your teacher training. I'm like, we don't own our teachers. Ask anyone you want. He said, no, no, no. So I sent him. Uh, now everybody who's teaching there, I think, is someone who's been at Yoga Oasis. T Tucson Yoga. There's someone... Uh, at least one person there who took our teacher training. So in that sense, um, uh, we definitely are supportive of each other and have uh, good relationships. That was Darren Rhodes with Yoga Oasis. And that's the buzz for this week. You can find all our episodes online at azpm.org and subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for The Buzz Arizona. We're also on the NPR One app. Megan Myskowski and Samantha Larned produced this week's show. We also had help from Mark McLemore and Adiva Nelson. Jim Blackwood is our production engineer. Our music is by Enter the Haggis. I'm Christopher Conover. Thanks for listening. Arizona Public Media's original programming is made possible in part by the Community Service Grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.